like your kids are always going to be envious of something just like we as adults are typically envious of someone having something that we don't have and you don't solve that by buying the thing that they want or by acquiring the thing that we want envy has to be figured out from from the inside hi this is danae i'm the founder of simple families Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, I have a chat with Joshua Becker. That's the voice you heard in the intro. Joshua is the founder of Becoming Minimalist, where his writing and work reaches millions of people every month. And about five years ago, he gave me a chance to write an article for his website, and it went viral. And that was really how Simple Families got started. So I have him to thank for that. In addition to running an online platform, Joshua is also a best-selling author. And today we're going to be chatting more about his new book, Things That Matter, Overcoming Distraction to Pursue a More Meaningful Life. In our worlds, we are surrounded by distractions, so this book couldn't have come at a better time. If you haven't already, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash community and join the brand new community. That's where we'll be gathering together and discussing all the new podcast episodes, and learning and growing together. I'm already enjoying talking with you all directly and getting to know so many of you better. So without further ado, here's my chat with Joshua. Hi, Joshua. How are you? Wonderful. How are you? I am good. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Oh, stop. Thank you for finally having me on the podcast. (laughs) Well, we've been trying to coordinate this for quite some time. That's true. But I'm glad to finally have you here and sharing a little bit about your new book, things that matter. I had to write a book in order to get on the podcast and it was <laughs> worth it. It was worth the three years just for this. Oh, well, I am so excited about this new book. I'm any, Everyone listening to the podcast knows that I've been talking a lot lately about digital distractions, which is something that you talk about in this book. Um, but you talk about distractions of all sort, which is not new to you, right? Uh, yeah, in many ways. Um, I, I did a podcast a little while ago about the book, and the the guy, one of my best compliments I think I've heard about the book, he said, uh, I know you're known for writing about minimalism, but I think this is the book that you were born to write, uh, yeah. which was very meaningful and powerful. I have been writing about minimalism, about the benefits of owning less, how all the things we own and all the things we pursue distract us from the life that we want to be living. And so this book is an extension of that thought, uh, moving beyond the distraction of physical possessions, but um, money and fear and past mistakes and technology and other distractions, I think, that keep us from uh, things that matter in the long run. Yeah. And you have two kids. Are they teenagers still? My son is 19 and okay. my daughter is 15, although she turned 16 in just a couple of days. So we've been practicing uh-huh. her driving. So oh, my, uh, um, she's, a, she's a sophomore in high school and then my son is a freshman at college. And I started writing about minimalism when they were five and two and now they're you know, 19 and 16. Yeah, I have so many questions for you about that journey Mm -hmm. and how parenting in a time of great distractions, especially for teenagers, that a lot lot of thoughts about that. And as I was reading your book, I was really thinking about how this, I mean, this has taken you years and years to get to this point where you've had this clarity, right? Yeah, I would say that. I would say that. So as a parent... How do you feel like you can communicate the things in this book to your kids? Or have you been able to? Well, I am under the general assumption that any value that we want to communicate to our kids 
happens the same way, whatever it is. Like, how do you teach minimalism to kids? I would say you you teach your kids about minimalism. You teach your kids about avoiding distraction the same way you teach them to be kind and compassionate and hardworking. You, you, number one, you've got to do it yourself. Like you're modeling it yourself. That's probably the most important mm-hmm. thing. Um, you uh, reinforce positive behaviors when you see them. Uh, you um, discourage negative behaviors when you see them. And then you hope for the best. <laughs> right. I, I, I think, <laughs> and, and I mean that, and I'm, and I'm, and I mean that in a positive way, like whatever. <clears throat> so minimalism, for example, like I, I don't want my kids to think that they're going to find happiness in possessions. I don't want them to waste their lives buying a bunch of stuff that they don't need. I don't want them rushing out and choosing a career just because it'll make them more money. Like I want them to pursue things that matter in the long run, whether they do that or not is going to be up to them. Like they may go buy the biggest house they can afford and fill it with as much stuff as they possibly want. However, they'll always they can always look back on the model that we set for them and the example that we set for them. And so they may run down the road of buying as much stuff as they can possibly afford. But when they get to the point that they realize that hey, this isn't as fulfilling as I thought it was going to be. They always have something to go back to. And, yeah. oh, this makes sense now uh, as to why my parents were doing this the way that they were doing it. Yeah, you're laying that foundation for them. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And then also anticipating that they may not stick to it. And they may they may or most likely will deviate. Yeah, uh, may or may not. Yeah, I will. Well, you know, you cross your fingers and always hope that they make make wise choices. How has it gone so far? Oh, so far so good. I mean, my daughter yeah. still lives with us, and um, my son is a poor college student. So, um, <laughs> so we'll see. But um, yeah, I think he, you know, some of the things that you 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 hope you see um, already. I I think you know from everything you could tell, he's kind and thoughtful and he works hard at his schoolwork. And so, um, yeah, I want to be pretty proud of that. I'm also a big fan of, um, over explaining to kids, um, especially young, like my kids were five and two when we started living a more minimalist lifestyle. And I never shied away from explaining why we were doing what we were doing or why we were spending money the way that we were spending or, if they came to us with something that they wanted um, and we weren't going to buy it, to be able to explain, hey, this is the reason why we're not we're not buying this. And I always think if we as parents don't have a good reason as to why we're making the decision that we're making, then maybe our kids have a point. You know, um, yeah. we should be able to articulate and explain why we're uh, making the decisions that we're making. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that sometimes when I do the explaining, it almost feels more like I am understanding my own motives better too, that I am gaining clarity through the explanation. Because a lot of that reasoning process goes on behind the scenes in my head and I'm not able to articulate it well. So when I feel like whenever I do explain things to my kids, it gives me more clarity. And I hope that they take away bits and pieces, but they're six and eight. So I know that a lot of it is still beyond their level mm-hmm. of reasoning, mm-hmm. but I'm always impressed at the little things that they pick up off, mm-hmm. up upon. But just this morning, we've been dabbling in doing screen-free weekends, and just this morning, my fa- my son, um, we've done four of them now, and we it's Thursday now when we're recording, and he asked me this morning, he said, why are we doing screen-free weekends and nobody else does? And I kind of stuttered and I didn't have a really good explanation. I mean, I've been talking about it on the podcast. I've been thinking about it, been talking about it on social media, but yet when he said it to me, I felt like I needed this like 30 second elevator pitch explanation to really get him to understand it. And I realized I didn't have that quite yet. And it made me think that maybe I'm not as strong in that conviction yet as, as I'd like to be. Mm. Did you come up with an answer? 
Um, I, st- I stuttered and I stumbled a lot. <laughs> and, and I told him that we are learning how to spend time together without screens so that we can enjoy each other's company more and we can be more focused in the time yeah. that we spend together. Did you feel like you were struggling to explain why we're doing it in a way that doesn't seem to speak ill of everyone who isn't? Mm. You know, in this situation, no, but in a lot of situations, yeah. yes. You know, how do we not be judgy in our responses? Because they're comparing, I mean, our kids are in essence comparing our life to somebody else's life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You wrote an article about envy a couple of years ago mm-hmm. that I still think about. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Uh, I've written a couple and um, okay. have always. Uh, I've been writing for 13 years. So remind me which one it was. I know <laughs> no, what I say. I like... know what I say about envy now, and I'm pretty sure it's the same thing I wrote back then. But I'm I'm wondering if I have written a couple thoughts. Um, and now I'm not gonna be able to quote it. But something along the lines of you can't chase envy or yeah. you can't outrun it. Can't outspend envy. You yeah. can't outspend envy, which is actually a great tie-in to what you're to what you're saying. I, I learned it. My sons don't remember the birthday, um, but we. Uh, they were younger, uh, elementary school, and we took him and a bunch of his friends. We had two car loads. We went somewhere to go do something for his birthday. Yeah, this was the article. Yeah, talk- yep, and uh, the and there were two kids in the back seat, and uh, the one's dad had a BMW, and the other's dad's had the other's dad had a Corvette, and they were jealous of the other person that their family had a Corvette and their family had a BMW. And it like it was it just occurred to me in that moment that no matter what you buy for your kids, there's always going to be something that they don't have. Um, and so you can't you can't outspend envy became the became the phrase. You can't like your kids are always going to be envious of something just like we as adults are typically envious of someone having something that we don't have. And you don't solve that by buying the thing that they want or by acquiring the thing that we want. Envy has to be, um, uh, has to be figured out from, from the inside, which, Mm -hmm. which by the way is a, a tough concept for kids and they're not in complete control of their own lives. But I think for adults, the way we overcome envy, uh, this is probably how my thinking has changed. I, I don't think this was in that original article. Like, I think that we overcome envy by living an intentional life focused on things that matter. Um, because if I'm living an intentional life focused on things that are important to me, then it doesn't matter that my neighbor just bought a new boat or bought a nicer car or is moving to a bigger house. Like it's okay that they, that he chooses to spend his money on all those things. And I don't care about that because I know that my money is being directed towards the things that are important to me. I think it's when we get unintentional and we, we go buy the bigger screen television or we buy more and more clothes to fill our closets and we're just buying more and more stuff with our money and then our neighbor buys the boat and we're like oh i wish i had bought the boat rather than the bigger yeah. screen television that was that was foolish right like when we kind of regret already the way the things that we're living our lives for and i think it becomes easier to become envious of someone making different choices but when we know hey i'm just directing my money towards things that matter, then it's okay that someone else is spending their money on something different. Yeah. Yeah. Having that underlying conviction and knowing what your goal is. Yeah. For sure. And it's funny that kids have a way of putting things into words that we're feeling, but we don't necessarily put our finger on like the Corvette versus the BMW comparison. Like most adults are not having that conversation orally, Mm -hmm. but they may be having that conversation in their heads. Yeah. 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 My daughter, we, we moved in the fall and we moved into a smaller, less updated house than we were in previously. And um, she said to me this week that our house is like the Encanto house. Have you seen Encanto? I have not. I've only oh, okay. heard the you song we don't joke. talk about. <laughs> so she said, 
our house is like the Encanto house after it falls down. <laughs> and I was, I was kind of, she's in kindergarten. I'm like, oh, that's kind of a zinger. <laughs> what? And and we bought the house with the intent of of fixing it up, but you know, I think that she's she's doing that comparison game. Mm-hmm. You know, we used to live in a nicer house, or what she perceived as a nicer house. Her friends have nicer houses. And now we live in this falling down in Concho mm-hmm. House, which it's really not, but that's her, her kindergarten perception. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, um, yeah, I think kids have a way of, of saying things, I think, that can put out some of those, those feelings that we're feeling inside and maybe don't even notice. Yeah. We're going to pause to take a three-minute word from today's sponsor. The first sponsor today is Fairty. I absolutely love Fairty, and I was so excited when they said that they wanted to sponsor the podcast. In fact, I'm pretty much living in my top sale overalls right now, which I didn't really understand why people wore overalls until I got these overalls, and now I completely get it. Fairty is a family-run brand that makes high-quality, timeless clothing with modern design and functionality. They're so confident in their quality that they have a lifetime guarantee. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. And right now, Fairty is giving listeners 20% off. So head to fairtybrand.com slash simple and use the code simple at checkout to snag 20% off your new spring staples. That code is simple at fairty, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand.com slash simple for 20% off. Fairtybrand.com slash simple. Our second sponsor for today is Prep Dish. If you've been around the podcast for a while, you know that I am a longtime fan of Prep Dish. Prep Dish is a meal planning service. Each week in your inbox, you'll get a three-part PDF document. The first part is the list of ingredients that you need to get at the grocery store. The second part is the prep day list, the things that you're going to do in advance to make your life easier during the week. And the third part is dish day the last few steps you have to do to actually get the food on the table. PrepDish has lightened my mental load beyond words. It's been a real gift to our family for so many reasons. Perhaps most importantly, the fact that being able to do the prep in advance in a very prescribed way has enabled me to enlist the help of my partner who's not generally home and available during the hours when I'm prepping dinner. So it has both lightened my mental load and redistributed some of it. If you want to give it a try, go to prepdish.com forward slash families to try two weeks free. Prepdish.com forward slash families for two weeks free. Our third sponsor for today is Pear Eyewear. Pear Eyewear is a new sponsor on the podcast. And to be honest, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to think about their product. But after giving it a try now, it's pretty cool and also kind of a minimalist stream when it comes to glasses. Here's how it works. You can change your glasses like you change your clothes. First, you get started by choosing a base frame. I chose clear. And then you pick top frames, which you attach to the front, so you can change up the color and the design and the look. So it's one pair of glasses with an infinite number of colors and designs that you can attach to it. Not only do I love it, but my eight-year-old is pretty desperate to get glasses now because he thinks it's so amazing. So try it out. Get glasses as unique as you are. One pair, infinite style, starting at just $60. Go to paireyewear.com slash simple for 15% off your first purchase. That's 15% off at pair, P-A-I-R, eyewear.com forward slash simple. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. They keep the show in business. Back to my chat with Joshua. All right, so let's get down to it. Tell us about the book. Things That Matter, Overcoming Distraction to Pursue a More Meaningful Life. And the book is about um, what are some of the distractions, societal distractions, internal distractions that that keep us from, um, that keep us from a life of no regrets is kind of the way I say it. Like, how do we get to the end of our lives and we're proud of the way we lived rather than wishing we had done it all differently? Not that there aren't some mistakes along the way, but as a general overall arc uh, of our lives. And one of the mistakes that, or one of the distractions that I talk about is how um, we tend to look for happiness in selfish pursuits, um, or at least that 
that can become a distraction uh, as opposed to um, living selfless lives, uh, generous lives, giving lives, uh, lives that serve others and help others that based on almost every study of positive psychology ever done ends up resulting in more life satisfaction at the end of our lives. And so I share a story um, about visiting a garbage dump in Ecuador. Uh, we were there to uh, do some work with a, with a nonprofit organization. I was leading a group of high school students actually on the trip. And one afternoon, we went and visited a, uh, we went and visited a garbage dump, which isn't like an, an American garbage dump that's under the ground. Like it was literally just this field full of, trash and the trucks would just come and dump it. And we met all of the families, uh, many of the families that lived literally in the, in the garbage dump and like their lives were that the, a, a truck would unload whatever was in their load. And then they would try and find things they could recycle for a couple cents or things that they could sell. And, um, this was their life. And it was, it was literally a life-changing moment uh, to recognize that people live, um, parents, kids, uh, older, old people, like they, they live their lives there, and this is this is what they do, and um, all the work that they can find um, with their lives. And it was, it was a like a life-changing moment of just being there and seeing there. And I think the point that I make in the book is that we don't begin living selfless lives by reading about people living in garbage dumps or even hearing about people living in garbage dumps and writing a check to help them. Like we, um, we begin living selfless lives when we get out and we, we get dirt under our fingernails and we start smelling the smells and and holding the hands and looking into the eyes of people who who genuinely need help um, and those are the situations that that change us yeah yeah it just makes me think about how disconnected we've all been for the past couple of years and been in a, unable in many ways to connect with other people in any way shape or form. And how do you feel like that lack of human connection has impacted you? That is a good question. Um, at the beginning, uh, when we were like very specifically isolated, uh, 15 days, whatever it ended up being, I, I don't recall. Um, I, uh, I work alone. Um, I, I enjoy being with people and being around people. Um, but I've, I've always just been a writer who, who blogs. And so I just have my little thing that I do. Yeah. And, um, it's not like I, I go to work every day and interact with a bunch of people. Um, and so I, I generally kind of thought that I liked being alone, uh, most of the time. Uh, but then we had whatever the time frame was of not being at all with anyone in the community, except some online stuff, which doesn't really isn't quite the same. Um, no matter how much people say it is, it's not. Um, and the first time I was around people again that I hadn't seen in real life and hadn't interacted with, uh, I think I realized how much I need human connection more than, more than I thought I did. I think I thought I was okay without it. Um, until I was reintroduced and I was like, man, I've been missing this more than, more than I thought. Yeah. Um, so certainly, I mean, certainly that aspect in terms of, um, interconnectedness and, uh, human relationships was something that, uh, I learned a lot. It was, a it was a, a time of, you know, um, unhealthy habits emerging and, um, feel like still kind of battling against some of them. I felt like I had gotten to a good point in my life and then all the, you know, everything's kind of taken from you and, um, having to, to relearn and, uh, work hard, be intentional about reshaking some of those, uh, unshaking some of those bad habits still. Yeah. And I've heard that from so many people. I've also heard from a lot of people that are very thankful that they found minimalism before the pandemic. I, 
I agree. I, I really thought that it had um, prepared us for it, um, as opposed to thinking, because there are a lot of, well, don't you wish you had all your stuff back? And I was like, no, like <laughs> just the opposite. Like I feel freer. I feel more mobile and flexible. I, I had been able to save some money through the, through the years. And so like, I felt more prepared for the pandemic as much as you can be prepared right. for it. Like I, I, I really felt like minimalism had, um, prepared me for it more than if I, if it hadn't. Possibly. Yeah. Well, and I think that one thing I saw, especially from parents was the, the desire to buy their way out of their kid's boredom and being home and feeling like the answer to it all was just buying the right toys, just getting the new outdoor play gear, whatever it might be. And that, that overconsumption habit just started to creep back up on a lot of people, even people who felt like they had a good grip on it. Yeah. I had a friend of mine and, uh, and he said, um, this was early on. He, he was like, Amazon was the only thing I could control. Mm. It felt like I, I, I couldn't control, if I was going to be able to go to work that day or not, I couldn't control the restaurant I wanted to go to or the movie we, or anything I wanted to do in my evening. The only thing I could control was buying something on Amazon and it would show up at my door the next day. And um, yeah, I thought that was a help, a helpful commentary. Yeah. And I, I mean, I definitely noticed sort of my old habits coming back as well. One in particular was mask buying. You know, when I found out that my kids were going to have to go to school masked, I had a lot of anxiety about that, especially because I have a kid who's hard of hearing. And I bought so many masks, so many masks, because the answer was just to get the right one, the one that was comfortable, the one that didn't block too much noise, the one that didn't pull on the ears, the one that was easy to wash. And I just couldn't find the right one. And and I mean, obviously, the answer wasn't in finding the right mask, but that's how I coped with my anxiety was to buy all of them. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Fell right back into those old habits that, that die hard. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It didn't, didn't solve the problem as <laughs> buying the things usually doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. So you're someone that has a huge presence online and online life can be so distracting. How do you balance that? Or has that been an uphill battle? Oh, I think it's always an uphill battle. Um, I suppose once you think it isn't a battle, that's probably a bad sign. I I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's a place you can get where it just comes natural to you. But I'm I'm certainly not at at that point yet. Um, I uh, I am not the hey technology is all bad and phones are all bad and the internet is all bad. Like I I think that's not true at all. I. I get to do what I do today because of social media and because of technology and because of the internet. Uh, I don't remember where I first saw it or where I first heard it, um, but uh, someone once described to me um, at least social media as and anything online as the difference between creating and consuming. Uh, and, and he said, this is like, this is the thought process that we need to be having, uh, because I can be online writing an article, recording a podcast, um, even commenting, even saying nice things to friends posts on social media. Like I can be online contributing to the world, uh, bringing good out into the world, or I can be online just scrolling social media endlessly, uh, playing another 10 levels of Candy Crush, binge watching another season of some television show. And if you fall into the constantly just consuming, then I think this is when tech, this is when the trivial, this is when social media really becomes a distraction as opposed to a tool that we use to bring good into the world. So that's how I always try to think about the difference between those two things. Um, when am I working? When am I contributing something good? And when am I just reading another news article or just scrolling through another thing or checking more stats on something that don't really matter? Yeah. That's been a, a helpful framing for me in terms of um, thinking through 
um, benefit versus cost. Yeah. And you have some big physical activity endeavors coming up, right? Tell us more about that. Oh, you mean I'm hiking the Grand Canyon? Yeah, that's no small thing. <laughs> no small, no small feat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, this coming weekend, at least when we're recording this, um, yeah, hike in the Grand Canyon, my second time of doing it. Uh, but, uh, by hike the Grand Canyon, we mean, uh, rim to rim to rim. So we start on the South rim, go down, go across, go up the North rim, come back down, go across and come back up. And then we do it all in one day. And uh, there's a group of about 25 of us. We're raising money for the Hope Effect, a nonprofit that I started several years ago. And um, so, yeah, see if we can do it. If you you don't hear from me, (laughs) if you don't hear from me, I'm still at the bottom. How much do you train? (laughs) Um. Well, I got a little of a little bit of a baseline. Uh, my son's doing it with me this time. Um, we ran a half marathon in January. Uh, we're doing the hike in April, so uh, we we did quite a three or four months of training to to run the half marathon, and then um, so build up at least some of those cardio muscles, I guess. Um, but hiking uses different muscles than running running on the road. So um, we've been hiking, going on long hikes for every weekend for the past two months or so. And then uh, our big training hike was a couple weeks ago. We go 26 miles uphill, um, which is the equivalent of uphill at the Grand Canyon. So if it's 52 miles total to hike the Grand Canyon, 26 is uphill and 26 is downhill. So we do the, we do the 26 uphill um, here at a local uh, a little local mountain. And then um, we don't turn around and hike back down like we will for the Grand Canyon. But Sound, sounds like torture, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited for you. Um, so I'm asking about this because I think about this idea. So I gave up drinking a couple years ago and I've cut way back on my phone use now. And I feel like people are going to ask me, you know, what's left? when you cut out the vices and you cut out the distractions, you know, what, what is left? And I think a lot of people feel like that. What would you say to people who ask that question? Well, what do you say? What have you found that's left? My relationships. Yeah. Yeah. The engagement with the people that I love and feeling good, showing up every day and feeling good. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I always say, um, well, number one, we did a, uh, I did a survey for the book. I did a nationwide survey and I always think that makes me sound smart. <laughs> Very um, official. And, uh, and a part of the survey, 70% of people say that they have identified a purpose or purposes for their life, um, which was actually a little bit higher than I thought it was going to be. Um, but very early on in the book, things that matter, we had, I had a chapter on how to find your purpose, or at least questions to start asking yourself to try to find it and thinking through, Mm -hmm. how can I live um, a meaningful life? And um, when the survey results came back that 70% of people already felt they knew how to answer that question, we moved that chapter to the end. We moved it to the end of the book as more of a um, uh, appendix at the end, extra bonus exercise at the end, rather than a, a, a part of the book. So that's high. That's 70, 76%? 70, 70%. 70%. Percent. Wow, I don't know. That feels yeah. really high to me because I feel like I don't even know most days. And I don't know. It's kind of my area. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's just such in, a big question. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so in broad terms, um, I found that minimalism, uh, even going back to your original question, I found that embracing healthier habits in my life didn't change what my values were. Um, I, even before finding minimalism, even before getting healthier, like I valued the same really three things, faith, family, and making a difference in the world. Um, those were the three things that were most important to me and continue to be the most important to me. What I found is that when I started removing distractions, when I started removing the pursuit of possessions or the pursuit of money, uh, getting more intentional with technology use, when, 
when I when when I became more intentional in those areas, I was able to accomplish more in those values than I thought I could accomplish. So faith, family, making a difference in the world were still the three things that meant most to me. I was just able to do more of those things. I felt like I became a better uh, follower of God than I would have before. I feel like I became a, a, a better father and a better husband than I would have before. I felt like I uh, have made a bigger difference in the world than I would have before. So for me, removing those distractions um, didn't leave me with, okay, what am I going to do instead? I already had a bit of a, a paradigm, a general direction that I was going. I just found more opportunity in those areas than uh, I had before, which I don't know entirely your past, but you'd probably say the same thing, mm-hmm. right? Maybe, I mean, yeah. I assume relationships were always important to you, you know, serving people, were always important to you. You're just able to do it easier better than now. you would have easier. Yeah, yeah. And I guess easier is an interesting word. It's, it's without the distractions, it becomes more clear what you need to do. And, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. when it gets hard, you're able to persevere more so. Mm. I think oh so. yeah. I like that. Ah, I do like that word easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about, especially like in the pandemic, so many people, I, I, one of the other things I'm glad that I found minimalism, I'm also glad that I gave up alcohol before the pandemic and I have nothing against alcohol. I drank a lot of alcohol for a lot of years. Anyone that's listening that still does. But I do think about how some people need to have just to set those own parameters so that they can thrive more so because had I still been drinking going into the pandemic, I feel like I would really be in a different place right now because it was a lot of, a lot of long, dark days. And I think about other people who, who fell into those habits and are, who are still struggling with those. And, um, and that feels hard, which I guess is why I, I I choose the word easier because I imagine what it would look like if I still had some of those distractions in life Mm. and it would feel a lot harder to be able to focus and show up in the ways that I wanted to. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about consumerism and how you feel like that can be a distraction, the ease of buying and how I feel like we're just kind of faced day in and day out with buying all the stuff and looking for the solutions for our problems. Yeah, that's true. That's true. (laughs) (laughs) And how do we notice it? (laughs) Because we all face it. Um, so I, 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 I learned to, uh, talk about the distraction of possessions in, in two different ways. Um, when we own, uh, more stuff than we need, then all the stuff we own takes time. We have to clean it. We have to organize it. We have to care for it. Um, Randy Elkhorn says every increased possession adds increased anxiety onto our lives, which everything we own takes up physical space in our home. It takes up mental space in our brain. Uh, It's a a bit of visual clutter around us, stealing our attention. And so everything we own becomes a little bit of a distraction from uh, the life that we want to be living. But there's another aspect where when we... Um, not just own more than we need, but constantly want more and more and more, uh, then this also becomes a distraction and it steals our attention and it steals our focus. It steals our energy. It steals our motivation. Like we constantly want more and more stuff. So it's like a a dual possessions really becomes a, a dual distraction in what we've accumulated and in what we're uh, pursuing. And I've really found that overcoming consumerism is a different journey, a different thought process than decluttering. Like there are a lot of people who want to declutter their home, but not a lot of people who say, and I really want to overcome 
consumerism. It's like the the mm-hmm. felt need of I just don't want all this stuff around me. Um, and so I I think it's a different. I always say there's tons of books at the bookstore about how to declutter your home, and not very many about how do we overcome consumerism. Yeah. And so it's a a different thought process, You're and right. um, they're they're connected, but it requires a little different a little different thinking and. Um, yeah, I always think as you begin to own less and start to see the benefits and articulate the benefits, then you start to overcome your desire for consumerism. Uh, the more you, uh, the more you, uh, make gratitude and generosity, a discipline in your life, not just a response to circumstances, generosity and gratitude. Um, we tend to think of them as responses to circumstances rather than disciplines that we embrace every day, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, The more we embrace gratitude and generosity, I think the more we overcome consumerism, the more we, the more we recognize advertisements and the messages that they're, that they're selling us. um, The more we begin to see money differently, that, that our money is only as valuable as, as what we choose to spend it on, that, I could use it to buy a new television or I could use it to help some uh, child go to college. Like when you, when you start to see how much bigger of a difference your money can make uh, rather than buying more things, I think this helps us overcome consumerism as well. Um, yeah. Those are some of the things that I think about in terms of overcoming consumerism going forward. But it's not, it's not easy. It's probably harder, I think. But yeah, I always say uh, owning owning less is great. Wanting less is even better. I don't know if this has impacted you, but I have found that sometimes consuming things as a minimalist can be consuming. So I told this story recently on the podcast, but I needed a new suitcase, and I dug really deep into mm-hmm. the suitcase research, like all the Reddit reviews, all the YouTube unboxing videos, comparing all the brands, because I wanted the one, the right one. I didn't want to mess around with the one that wasn't the right one. Do you ever fall into that? A little bit. I I mean, my I wear black v-neck t-shirts and <laughs> I've worn J. Crew black v-neck t-shirts for about 10 years. Yeah. And recently when I got new ones, um, they had, sh- they had, uh, they started manufacturing them in a different country and uh, and they don't fit as well. Oh no! And so I've been on, I don't know, probably a year and a half, not actively every day, but like a year and a half of thinking, okay, where am I going to find the the one? Where am I going to find the brand that <laughs> that works and and fits? And it's there's a fascinating article, um, Harvard Business Review. I forget the name of the article, um, but they they dive into this question of. Uh, can money make you happy or not? Like this age old question and all this different research about once you make 50,000, more money doesn't make you happy. Or is it 75 or there is no limit? Like all this different research that comes out. And they studied 100,000 people. And um, what they really determined is not necessarily how much money you have, but how much is money a priority in your life is what determines how how happy you are in your relation to it. And specifically, trading time for money uh, lends itself to less satisfaction in life than when we keep time, even at the expense of losing money. And so like to give the example of, I can take the promotion that's going to require a bunch more work, but I'm going to make a bunch more money doesn't tend to bring us as much happiness as if we had just stayed in the other position that met our needs that gave us more time. And one of the examples they gave was constantly shopping, researching shopping, that mm-hmm. that there comes a point where you don't want to waste the money on buying the luggage that you don't end up being happy with. So you, you invest all this time in making the one right purchase when there was probably a, a break even point at right. some point where if you just had bought the thing and saved the time, even if it ended up breaking at some point, yes. you still would be. Yeah. And I think satisfied. there's the stress and anxiety that goes into that process too, of wanting to get the right stuff and wanting to get the best stuff. And 
what you get is just marginally better than what you would have gotten off the shelf at the store probably. But, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I definitely fall into it. And I think it feels kind of like a minimalist problem where, you know, you're just trying to be really narrow and focused and get the right things. So you don't have to buy too many. And yeah. um, yeah, I'm wondering how, mu- how many other people get, get sucked into that too. Maybe it's just a really smart minimalist problem <laughs> like you. I, do, I'm just, do you I'm find just... that with your running shoes? How'd you, how did you choose your running shoes for this adventure? Uh, I went, um, I, I went to, a a, a st- the first time I ever went to like an official running, hiking mom and pop, uh, store and, um, they have a great reputation here in Peoria. And, um, and so I went and they, they like videotape you walking and then they run it through their little thing and they have the specific and they, you know, electronically digitally take the size of your foot width and length and then they have certain recommendations that come from it so that's how that came about yeah that's the very analog way of doing it going to the mom and pop shop and relying on the experts to tell you yes right indeed indeed how uh, how lovely that is and how i'm hoping you know i feel like this shift in the past decade has really led a lot of us to you know try to find everything online because you can find i just ordered my contacts online with a vision exam right? I didn't even have to go to the eye doctor. I could just like put my phone 10 feet away and take a vision exam online. And I thought how fascinating that I feel like we have removed so many humans from our lives. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to pay attention to, right? When I'm leaning into skipping my eye appointment and doing my vision exam on the internet on an app, because I don't want to take the time to go see a human eye doctor. Wow. You know, and how how many times are we doing that without really even noticing it? How is how is technology just kind of taking over without us thinking too much about it? Interesting. Just yesterday, I had uh, we had a crack in our windshield, and so wanted to submit a claim. And exact same thing. Took the phone out, and it had me take all these specific pictures from these specific angles and send it in. And um, yeah, it hadn't even occurred to me that not that long ago I would have met someone new, yeah. you know, even if just, even just briefly, um, yeah. had an interaction instead it was just with the phone. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know, all we can do is start noticing these things, right. And yeah. trying to be more intentional little by little. Yeah, for sure. So tell us more about where we can find your book and find you online. Uh, the book is called things that matter, overcoming distraction to pursue a more meaningful life. And, uh, it is available anywhere and everywhere in every available format. I think, I think we've covered physical audio and digital is the only formats right nowadays. Um, so it can be found anywhere. Uh, my home base is becoming minimalist.com and, uh, certainly involved, um, YouTube channel and social media accounts and, um, uh, a couple of digital magazines and stuff that, that I do, but becoming minimalist.com is always home base for me. So, um, Great. everything runs through there. All right. Well, I'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. If you want to check out Joshua's new book or get in touch with him, head over to the show notes at simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 307. And you'll find all that information there. Thanks so much for tuning in. I invite you to join us in the brand new community at simplefamilies.com forward slash community. I'd love to get to know you better there. Thanks again and have a good one.